Hey, listen, um, we're in the third week, the third and final week of a three-part series that we have called, that I've called, A Believer's Guide to Victory. Now, a lot this year, as I look at the progression of where we've been and what God has been speaking to us in preparation for um, things we've said, um, revival, things we've said for uh, a move of God, things we've called a victory, I recognize that sometimes those things feel far off. And because those things feel far off, God can feel far off. And then you leave this place and you start your week and you engage in your week or you engage with your family, you engage with your job. And it feels like victory and it feels like God can be so far off. Can I tell you, he's right here in front of you. He's right here with you. He's here in our gathering. He inhabits, occupies our praise and he joins our gathering. And so if God is close, those things are not far off. That victory for your life, that answer that you're waiting for is not far off. Revival is not far off. I want to be like David in the Old Testament where he would say constantly, Oh God, revive me. Just revive me as a regular part of my day, as a regular part of my life. Sometimes I think we, we relegate and delegate revival off to some future event that someone else is responsible for. What if revival started in me? What if a revival started in you? I believe revival could start in Windsor. Anybody with me? All right, come on. These are important days in which we're living and we're talking about these things. And we need to be prepared. I know you're facing a lot, like I'm facing a lot, my family and your family. We're facing a lot of different things that feel heavy. We're asked to do more with less. And I know the weight sits on our shoulders. And I just thought, you know what, we just need a few Simple tools, a few simple tips, if you will, a guide, a believer's guide to victory. So if you haven't been with us, you can always go back to our website and find these messages and re-watch them, re-listen. Um, watch and listen on the go. You can go catch up. Maybe if you got behind or your family was away, you can go back and catch those. I'll just touch on the titles really quickly and that was in, first, in the first week, in week one, we said stop believing lies. Some of you are here with, that, uh, here with us for that. Um, say that with me. Stop believing lies. We don't want to believe lies. We want to believe the truth. We want to believe the truth about God. We want to believe the things that God says about himself and not what others say about him. We have a very real enemy that would say different things and would tell us lies about God. But God wants us to believe what he says about himself. He wants us to believe the truth about himself, what's good about him because he is good. He wants us to believe the truth about ourselves because the world and even our flesh at times, right, the circumstances and situations we find ourselves in, um, the people around us sometimes um, tell us lies about who we are. We want to know who we are. We want our identity to be in Christ. We want to know who we are based on the truth of what God says about who we are. Then last weekend we got into week two and the title of that message was Stay in the Word. That's right. So stop believing lies and stay in the Word. That If we're going to know the truth, we need to be in the Word of truth and that is the Word of God and the Word of God is the truth. And so we've got to be in the Word of God and have the Word of God in us. Now here's the third one. Here's this morning. Yukaya, I'm so glad you're on for this and I'm so glad you're all in the room for this because I believe God is speaking to us about something here. And there are probably more tips and, and uh, more steps to victory, but I think these three are, are really important. I have loved the conversations coming out of our home groups. I have loved, man, the emails and some of the follow-up questions and some of the, the discussion and some of the breakthrough that have been happening in families and, and in our groups that we meet around um, the city and around the county. And we, we are, are experiencing um, breakthrough and an answer and I believe victory. Um, so here comes week three. Maybe you saw this coming, maybe you didn't. But here's week three. Week three is this Start going to church. Now, now what you're I know what you're thinking. I thought about this a lot this week. And as soon as I said that, I know you're going to think, well, I'm here. Right? Somebody was thinking that. You don't have to raise your hand. I've got this one, Pastor. I've, I've got this one covered. I don't need this one. But the emphasis, if you will, the emphasis, listen, is not on start but the emphasis is going to be on going. Start going 
to church. So this isn't some sort of correction. Um, this, is, this is rather um, a question that I think that I hear coming up more and more and more. And that is, why go to church? Why make the effort? Why? And I have three reasons. That probably doesn't surprise anybody. Of course I do. I remember um, in Bible college, I remember in um, our study um, uh, homiletics and, and study of kind of the art of preaching. And I remember one of my classmates, he just sat a couple desks over and, and uh, maybe a, a row in front of me. And I remember him stopping um, the lecture one day and saying, well, well, how many points does a good sermon have? And uh, my, my Bible professor, very smart man, wise man, he was also a pastor, and he said, well, at least one. A good sermon has at least one point. Otherwise, it's pointless. Okay, and so um, you know me if you've been around me for a while. I like to do things um, in threes, and I think if one point is good, three points is better. So uh, here we are. I have three reasons for you this morning. And as I was thinking about this week, um, over the last few weeks, because I knew where I was headed, I was thinking about um, a guy. I heard this story about this guy that got up one Sunday morning, and he told his wife, I'm not going to church today. I'm just, I'm not into it, and I'm going to give you three reasons why I'm not going to go to church today. And first of all, he said, number one is, I, I don't like the sermons. I just, I've never really liked the sermons. And he said, and number two is, um, I, I don't like um, the people. Um, they, they look at me weird. Um, they, they talk about me behind my back. Um, they're just, they, they're generally just kind of rude. Um, and um, uh, number three is um, they don't like me. So um, go figure, right? So number one, I don't like the, the sermons. I don't like the messages. Number two, I don't like the people. And number three, they don't like me. And so his wife, um, as, as uh, most women, um, good women, good wives, from time to time, they they have to say, um, they have to step into the gap and they say, well, you are going to church today. Um, you're going to church today and, and I'll give you three reasons why you're going to church today. And, and that is number one is I got up and I got ready and I'm going to church. So that's the first reason, I'm going. And the second reason is the kids are going. I got the kids up. They're ready. They're dressed. They've eaten. The kids are going. So number one, I'm going. Number two, the kids are going. And number three, you're the pastor, and they're expecting you to be there. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about um, if, what happens if the pastor shows up and nobody else shows up. I just want to talk about that for a little bit why we're together this morning. That sound okay? All right, I told you there was three points. Here's number one. Number one is the first reason to go to church is God's presence. Everybody say that with me. God's presence. All right. Um, understand, I understand. You've heard me teach. We preach God is everywhere. This is his omnipresence, okay? That God is everywhere. The Spirit of God is everywhere, all places, all the time. Then there is his inner presence. Presence, inner, I-N-N-E-R, inner presence, all right? That the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God lives within us. But then there is his manifest presence, okay? Which is his made known presence. And that happens when we gather, when we are together. When we come together, he is here and we experience God, and you know this, we have, and you have, and we have stories, and we'll tell some of those stories this morning, of the powerful ways that God shows up, the way that he's seen here in our gathering, in ways that we just don't see him anywhere else. I'll show you some scriptures. First, when, when God um, established, when, when he gave, when he made the tabernacle on earth, first... 
um, when, when God told them to make me a place on earth, the very first one, this is to Moses, this is um, the tabernacle of Moses, even before Solomon's temple, God gave him some instructions, gave Moses some instructions. And by the way, he said, what you see in heaven, build on earth. To Moses, what you see in heaven, build on earth. So the, the tabernacle, then the model for the tabernacle, for the place for God on earth, is, model, is a model of heaven. It's incredible to me. Here's what he said in Exodus 25, uh, verse 8. We'll put the verses up and you can follow along. If you're taking notes, just write these down and get into them this week as we stay in the Word. This is what we're talking about. Start going to church. Emphasis on the going. Going to church. What does it mean to go to church? Why do we go to church? So Exodus 25 says, And let them, he's talking about the people here, make me, God speaking, make me, God, a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst or dwell among them or dwell with them. So God wants a place where he can live on the earth. And then later on in Exodus 25, if we look at verse 22, he says, and there, talking about the sanctuary, the place, there I will meet with you and I will speak with you. See, something happens when we come together, when we gather together. It's important that we gather. And we see Jesus confirm this in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 18, um, it's in verse 20 where he says, you've heard this verse before, for where two or three are gathered, where they are coming together in my name, I am there in the midst of them, or I am there among them. This is, it's his presence, the presence of God. We are seeking the presence of God, to be in the presence of God. And as I said, I bet you remember some times in your life, some church services, maybe some conferences, some camps, some moments where you sense the presence of God like you had never sensed the presence of God before. You sensed him so close, so close that you could even, maybe some of you have said to me, I could feel him. He was that close. His presence was that real. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Amen? Yes. We've experienced this. The presence was so strong. Maybe some of you remember when God got angry with the people of Israel. They were traveling through the wilderness and he said to Moses, he was angry. He was upset. He said, I am not going to go with you into the promised land, but I'll send my angel. And does anybody remember Moses' reply? He said, if, if, if your presence doesn't go, I don't want to go. Okay? And, and he made this incredible statement that I think is it's just so important for us. He said, if your presence doesn't go with us, how will we be different than any other people in the world? I mean, I want you to think about this in our context, in the world that we live in. He's saying it's the only thing that sets us apart. It's the only thing that distinguishes us from every other people and every other nation. It's, it's, if you don't show up, if you're not part of our gathering, if your presence is not here when we gather, we're no different than any other organization or, or any other gathering or any other meeting in the world. The reason why this meeting is different than all those other meetings and all those other things and all those other places is because the Spirit of God shows up. The presence of God is here. Let's not forget this is God's house. I think we forget that sometimes. So, number one, His presence. Told you there was three. Here comes number two. Number two is His presence. Power. Everybody say his power. His power. So his presence and his power, God's power. Now, we just read in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 18, 20, um, just, just a moment ago, that if two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Some of you have heard that verse before, maybe quoted it. Let me just show you the verse right before it, okay? Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. 
says, Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And then he says, for, and, and this, is, this is a word, this is a preposition, which means because, because. So this is why it's done. This is why it happens. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. See, too many of us, have, we've never made the connection between these two verses. So the reason that what you ask for is done or happens is because God is there in the gathering. Do you see it? He's there in the gathering. He's there with us. His presence is there. He's standing among us right with you. And even right here, right now, his presence is here. That's awesome. And if his presence is here, then his power is here. If his presence is there, his power is there. Many people want the power of God in their lives. I want the power. I need the power of God in my life. But too often those people don't go to church. They don't come to the gathering where his presence is. And because his presence is there, his power is there. Now, growing up, many of you know, those of you that know me know I grew up in church. And, and we grew up, um, when I was growing up, going to church on Sunday morning. And on Sunday, come on, somebody was at church with me, right? On Sunday, Sunday morning, and on Sunday night, and just, let's go ahead and finish it up. And on Wednesday, Wednesday night. <laughs> That's right, some of you grew up when I did. So we were at church at least three times a week on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And so that is if there wasn't something extra or something special or youth group or these kinds of things. But real quickly, speaking of Wednesday nights, um, we're kind of we're going old school and, and bringing back Wednesday nights here at New Song Church. And there is such life and such vibrant life and activity on our campus every Wednesday night. We have home groups happening really all around the area um, in like five or six cities now, um, in two counties, in two languages. What's happening in groups is remarkable. But we leave Wednesday open or free from home groups or those other um, group gatherings um, to be on campus. And if you don't know what's going on on Wednesday evenings, check out our website um, or pick up kind of the new listing of groups that are going on. We have groups for moms. Well, just a solid group of moms from this church, other churches, no church, all around the county gathering on Wednesday nights. We have Kids Club where kids from all over our community come to learn about Jesus and to, to play games and to, to gain a biblical worldview that will serve them now and the rest of their lives. We have a um, youth group happening for high school and middle school. We have all these new groups happening on Wednesday nights and there's just this life that's here. So if you're looking for a midweek connection point, I would say we have that for you. Men, women, all these things that are happening on Wednesday nights here at New Song. Um, be aware of those things and, and share those things with those in your life that you care about and those people that you love that, that need some help and some hope. I'm telling you, you can find it here on Wednesday nights. What I'm not saying, church, listen to me. What I'm not saying is that you have to be here all the time. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not up here uh, guilt tripping anybody, uh, talking about what used to be and that needs to be. That's, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not even suggesting that you're here four Sundays a month or every single weekend because I know we travel. The world is different now. We, we travel more often. Our kids have sports and other activities, things like that. But I'd like it to be more than once or twice a month. I'd like us to, to move it into the place of priority instead of just having it on the list of options for the weekend. That we would start going to church. That we would be engaged in church and church life. So please hear me. I, this is not a sermon about attendance. That is not what I'm up here talking about at all today. I have no underlying motives this morning for this third part, for this message. It's not about numbers. Not here, not in Ukiah, not anywhere. Okay? Um, 
It's not attendance that we need. It's the presence of God that we need. It's the power of God that we need. See, it's not for me. Uh, it's for you. It, it's not that you need more of me. It's that we all need more of God. And I'm just trying to help you with that, okay? All right, I'm just trying to help you with some of the stuff that, that we're dealing with, that I'm dealing with in our everyday lives. And this is what happens when we get together. This is what happens when we come together. I've seen it. I know the stories. God's exponential power when we come together. So many stories. Um, I remember um, a lady that, that, that came forward after service. She said, I've been dealing with these migraine headaches for like two or three months, really most of my life, but they've been so intense and so just overwhelming, I've not been able to come to church. <laughs> but I got up this morning and God said, go to church. And she came to church and during the music, during the praise and worship, as we were lifting his name, as we were enjoying his presence, she said it felt like just the back of my skull, the back of my head just started getting so warm. And the more I sp sang, the more I spoke out the truth of who God was, it just got warmer and warmer and, and my headache went away. She hasn't had a migraine since that time, everybody. I mean, the presence and the power of God is real. We've had countless people sit in this room struggling, wrestling over decisions, life decisions, big decisions, job decisions, family de decisions. And they have sat with no clarity on what they were to do and being overwhelmed with just the weight of stress and the pressure of these decisions, the people that were depending on them. And sit here in a service on Sunday morning during praise and worship or during message, get a word where they got such clarity that they walked out of here with the confidence of God to make that decision and to take that next step in their life and to realize the victory that God had waiting for them. We've had relationships and marriages healed in the gathering. You have stories too. I remember one couple, oh, you know who you are. It had come for counseling. It had sought counseling outside the church. It, it seemed like they would exhausted every possibility, every option of, of what it was to, to be reconciled, to come toward each other. They could not come toward each other. And I remember one Sunday morning, kind of like this morning, where there was just this moment where the worship was extended and things continued to happen and God continued to move and God continued to speak. And there was a moment where that husband just wrapped his arm around his wife. And there was a moment of healing where they just began to lift their hands and praise God together. And that marriage is still together today. And that marriage is still together and happy and healthy today. Because the power is here. Because the presence of God is here. How do these things happen? The Old Testament, Deuteronomy talks about when we come together, the exponential power of what God does when we come together, the Spirit of God. Deuteronomy 32 in verse 30 says, how could one have chased a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight? It's the power of God. It's the power of God, everybody. But people have such a difficult time coming to church. Have you noticed that? Sometimes I think we're like butterflies or bullfrogs. Butterflies, they just kind of flit around, right? They just land somewhere for just a minute. They kind of flit around from church to church and, and they never really land long enough in one place. And, and then there's the bullfrogs that will just kind of come and just kind of sit on your lily pad until somebody approaches them and tries to have a relationship with them and they just kind of blow up and they just take off, right? They just move on somewhere else because somebody tried to have a relationship with them. I've said this to so many people. Probably so many of you, <laughs> and some of you are still here because of it, you need to be planted. You need to be planted. Let me show you Psalm 92, verses 13 and 14. It says, they are planted. Say planted. 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 They are planted in the house of the Lord. Planted, not attending I'm not asking you to attend, I'm asking you to go. I'm asking you to engage. Planted, they flourish in the courts of our God, that they shall still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap, that means full of life. They are fresh and green and they are flourishing. Look at it again, fruitful, 
fresh and flourishing. Three points. It's all throughout the Bible. All right? God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, are you with me? So three points. All right. But those promises are only good for those that are planted. you got to get planted. Not for those that bounce around from church to church that are here and then they're not. You need to be planted somewhere. Are you with me? Are you following me? So many testimonies. These that I've shared this morning. Obviously God, but through the church where God shows up with his presence and his power in the gathering. All right, here's number three. We've talked about God's presence. We've talked about God's power. Number three is God's people. Everybody say God's people. Now, some of you are thinking, why? <laughs> why? If I've got God's presence and I've got God's power, why do I need God's people? A question I ask every week. No, uh, just kidding. Uh, all right. But I'm going to tell you why. All right, right here. I'm going to tell you why. Because here, just to sum it all up, you, you, because his presence, because God's presence and God's power comes through his people. Okay? Comes through his people. You need people. I need people. We need one another. I've heard people say, oh my gosh, have I heard people say, I, I'm good, Pastor. It's just me and God. Ever heard that? I won't ask you to raise your hands. Ever said that? I just, I'm we're good. It's just me and God, which is wrong on so many levels. I mean, first of all, grammatically, uh, it should be God and I. But uh, it's just, but it's wrong on so many levels. They say it's just me and God, Pastor. We, I'm out here. We got it. It's, it's all I need. I just need God. But that's. Can I just tell you? That's not the way God set it up. It's just not. You need someone else. We need each other. Okay. Out of all that God created, go back to the very beginning when God created all things, when he created all, everything was good. He said that everything was good except for one thing when he created man and he saw man's aloneness. When he saw that man was by himself, I mean, think about it. At the end of every day, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. God makes man, forms man, and he says that it wasn't good. Not good that he would be alone. Not good that it would just be me and him. Not good that it would just be him by himself. So what wasn't good? I'll show you some scriptures here. Sometimes I don't think we realize just how incredible it is. That we are called the people of God. We have some songs that we sing, some new songs that we sing that I think reference this. And, and even if it's not the main thing, it stands out to me that it is so powerful and so profound that we are called, incredible that we are called the people of God. Just because we just don't realize that most people don't have a, a Jewish heritage, all right? We've, we've been grafted in to be included, adopted into the nation of Israel. But the Jewish people understood it. The audience that was hearing this understood this. So let me show you a couple scriptures where Peter is writing to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, and where Paul is also writing to the Gentiles. Well, look at Peter chapter 2, verse 10. It says, once you were not a people, but now, but now you are God's people. Here he's quoting from the Old Testament book of Hosea. You'll see Paul actually mentioned that. If we look at Romans chapter 9, we'll put that up for you. Verse 25, as indeed he says in Hosea, Paul says, those who were not my people, I will call them, what? My people. And here's the scripture in Hosea that they're referring to in Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. Then I will say to those who were not my people, I will call my people. And I will say to not my people, I love that, you are my people, and he shall say, you, and you shall say, you are my God. It's good to be part of the people of God. We need the people of God. We need each other. You need me, and I need 
you. We need each other. And Jesus backs it up. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment of all? He says, well, obvious, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. But the second is like that. And the word there that is the same is that it is equal to, that the second is equal to it. And that is to love your neighbor as yourself, love others as yourself. And he makes this incredible statement. He says, Jesus says, on these two commandments, Commands, hang the law and the prophets. Okay, what is that? What does that even mean? Maybe you've heard that before, read that before. The law is the first five books of the Old Testament, and the prophets is the rest of the Old Testament, the major and minor prophets. Because they didn't, they didn't have the New Testament the way that we do. They were the New Testament, okay? But they didn't have it at that time. So when Jesus referred to the scriptures, the law and the prophets, he was saying that all of the Bible, the whole Bible, hangs on these two commandments. These two commandments. Let me say those two commandments just a little different way, just so you can remember them. Love God and love people. Love God and love others. Let me say it this way. Have a relationship with God and have a relationship with people. This is the top priority. This is the most important thing. This is what will communicate or relay to the world that we are the people of God. We need both. You need both. And I believe Scripture addresses the why because you're wondering, okay, I'm, I'm buying in, but why? why? Why do I need both? I know I need a relationship with God, but why do I need a relationship with people? Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, he's putting some things in order, but he's also encouraging these things that they are to be doing. All right, he's trying to help them do it better. I'm trying to help us do it better this morning. He makes a statement um, that we need to understand, and, and, and we do need to understand the way Paul writes and the way that he's writing here, because he'll ask a question in his writing, and then he will answer it. He'll, he'll provide the question, but then he'll come in behind and he'll give the answer. Um, he'll say something like, shall we consider continue in sin that grace may abound? You know, God forbid. No. He, so, so he asks the question, then he supports it with the answers, all right? So this is what he does with this one here in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. Look at it with me. When then, brothers, in other words, how does all of this work? What then, brothers? Um, this is, and then comes the answer. When you come together... Each one of you has a hymn or a song, a lesson or a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Let all things be done for building up. That's what that word for edification. Edification means for building up, okay? But apparently, he's saying the way that this happens, the way that this occurs, the way that we are built up, the way that we are edified is by someone else's song, by someone else's teaching, by someone else's revelation. Listen to what God is saying. I'm going to give someone else what you need. And you're going to have to come together to get it. That's what he's saying. Because I've designed it that way. God's designed it that way. I don't want you to live. It's just me and you. I want you to live in community, to assemble, to come together. I want you to congregate. That's the word in the Old Testament. And they were called the congregation. Anybody ever heard of the signal trumpets? The signal trumpets. Most people haven't. It's okay if you haven't. But the signal trumpets, let me just show you a place in the Bible that calls them the signal trumpets. It's in the book of Numbers. All right, we'll put it out for you. And then I'll show you where God told Moses to make them and what they were for. Look at this. Numbers chapter 31, verse 6. Then Moses sent them to war with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. Now that's Numbers 31, 6. Now back up to Numbers 10, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Make two silver trumpets of hammered work you shall make them, and number one, you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for breaking camp. In other words, directing the movements of the congregation or the camp. And then in Numbers chapter 10, verse 9, And when you go to war in your land against the adversary who oppresses you, anybody have an adversary? 
Anybody feel like in life sometimes something's just coming against you, is oppressing you, is holding you down, is holding you back? Okay, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord God, your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. Come on, somebody. Somebody needed to hear that this morning. Here's what he's saying, what I just read. When you come together, it's all for edification. It's all for building up. Edification, direction, protection. Three points again, okay? Trying to make my point. All right, edification, building up. Why come together? I'll tell you right now. Why come to church? Because you need to be edified. You know this. We know this. We need to, before we go out there, we need to come in here to be filled up, to be built up, all right? To get direction for your life, to get protection from the enemy. Because you know the one that the wolf devours? The one on the outside, the one on the edge, the one that's disconnected. Oh my gosh, how many times have I heard people tell me this year, this last year, two years, five years, I feel so disconnected. You know the one that the wolf devours? The one that just ever comes every once in a while, every now and again? The one that doesn't join a group, that doesn't come on Wednesday nights, that doesn't get connected, that doesn't take their next step, that doesn't engage in their own growth and their own discipleship? Listen. Listen, we're, we're all sheep, right? That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we're all sheep. We're all like sheep that have gone astray. We're the sheep of his pasture. So, Listen, if, if you're on the edge, if you're back here kind of outside the circle, and you're out here, and we're sheep, and we know this is where the enemy is, and this is where the, where the wolf is, you need to go, excuse me, 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 and get right in the middle of that flock, and be right there for direction, right up by the shepherd, right? For direction and for protection in your life. You need to get right in the middle because we need others around us. We need the, the, the help and the support of one another. You have answers that I need. I have answers that you need. We need to get connected. We need the gathering. But I'm gonna take it one step further. We need to not just gather, we need to assemble. It's not just gathering, it's assembling. Now you're probably thinking, What's the difference between gathered and being assembled? There's one thing. It's one thing to see. I actually went and looked this week. I saw it on Facebook Marketplace, and there was this pile of bricks, all right, for sale, all right? And really, because it was just a pile of bricks, um, they were actually surprisingly affordable. There wasn't a great value um, put on them. There is some value. There's a value put on each brick. Um, people um, in masonry, they will tell you there's a certain uniqueness about each brick. There's a certain, um, uh, just a distinction, a certain even beauty about each brick. A brick has strength. I mean, if you ever got hit in the head with a brick, you would say, that brick has some strength. All right, there's some, some power there. But when you start putting bricks together, I mean, I didn't think of this till just right now, but when we drove through our neighborhood, and drove through neighborhoods after the 2017 fire, after the Tubbs fire. What was left standing? The chin bricks that had been brought together and put together. Not just piles of brick, but bricks that had been properly put together in relationship to one another. Beautiful works of art. Beautiful homes are created. Strength, lasting strength is found when we take those individual bricks and we put them rightly together. When we assemble them. Not when we just gather a bunch of bricks together. I, I mean, I've, there's, there's lots of churches. There's lots of groups where just gather together as piles of bricks. But if we can assemble those together, if we, if we allow God to assemble us together the way that he's designed, then our strength is multiplied. Our protection is multiplied. God, the vision of God, the presence of God is multiplied. So I just think that might be speaking to somebody this morning. All right. That's a good illustration, isn't it? Will you remember that one? I hope so. But let's put some scripture to it. All right. Hebrews 10.25. I've got a, this is probably one you've read before. But maybe you haven't seen it exactly in this light, the way I want to use it this morning. A lot of pastors were using this scripture after the, the pandemic and after the shutdown. It's not how I'm using it this morning. I want you to really listen. Don't check out. Listen. Hebrews 10, verse 25. Not neglecting or forsaking the what? 
the gathering, coming together, right, the meeting, meeting together, the assembling, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, watch this, and all the more, so much the more, as you see the day approaching. I believe the day is approaching. I believe we can feel the weight of that and even some of the pressure of that, certainly. It shows up in our daily lives. It shows up in the evening news. It shows up in our world, all right? These are not times um, where um, our church um, attendance or priority should be decreasing. It should be increasing. And yet at the same time, I see it become more and more difficult for people to be here. A hundred to two hundred churches are closing in the U.S. this week. But we should be going to church. All, we should be coming together. We should be assembling all the more. We should be gathering more. We should be assembling more. Now we've seen the miracle so many times. The healings, the way that God has manifested himself, his presence in the assembly, his power. When the people of God, in the people of God, for the people of God. And when his manifest presence, um, when he manifests his presence, it, it, is, it is undeniable. We should be assembling more. Would you bow your heads in this room? Thank you, God. We praise you right now. I'm just thinking, God, of the ways that you have led us, the way that you have shown up, the way that you have fought on our behalf, the way that you have protected us, God. You, God, created the church. The church was your idea. The church is your love. You established the church through your son, Jesus Christ. God, you provided a place for your people to come together. I pray, God, that something would rise in us this morning. And as I do every week, I would ask that you not just listen to my prayer, but that you pray. We are a praying church. This is a house of prayer. Let it be a house of prayer right now as you ask the Holy Spirit, what is it, God, that you want me to hear? What is it that you want me to take away from this message? What is it that I need to, to, to take hold of? What is it that I need to take with me to share with those around me, to those that are out there telling me, man, for the last five years, how many times have I heard, well, I'm living my best life. I'm living my best life. I'm living for me. It's me and God. And that story and that narrative has just got kind of tired and it's starting to break down and I hear it in people's hearts and I see it in people's faces and God we, we, we need you we are desperate for you desperate to know you to know your presence God would you keep your word and pour out your presence pour out your spirit on the earth like never before on all God we need your presence we need your power we need your people. May we be a people that love you and love one another, that love others. May that be the distinction. May that be the marker that those are people of God. Those people have spent time with God. Those people have been in his presence. They're not so moved or activated or aggravated by, by, by some of the, the, the issues of the day and the problems of our world, but they've been with God. It's clear on their face. It's clear in their love for one another. It's clear in their love for others that we would be a people that love well. And I know, I know we're, not, we're not perfect. I'm not perfect. The church is not perfect, but it's still the church. And it's still the place, it's still God's house. And it's still the place where we press in and seek God, can seek God with all of our hearts. And as we do, he is there. He is here with us. And we can receive guidance. We can grow in him and positively affect the world around us. Positively affect, peop affect people's lives. I want to encourage you this morning, church to go, to start going to church, to start being the church. And I will love to see you back next week. <laughs> In Jesus' name.
Amen.